Hello, my name is Ken Kinter and I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. The purpose of today's presentation is an introduction to stages of change. This is part one of a, part, a two part video series. And as usual, my contact information is on this first slide. Before I get started, I wanna give a little credit where credit is due. Uh, this presentation was made possible by a grant by the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, they've been funding the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative, which is an effort, um, a joint effort by Rutgers and the Department of Health to help improve conditions at New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals. And uh, our work there, our mission there, as you see here, uh, would not be possible without their generous support. So we thank them for that. So on to the presentation. Uh, again, this is just a, the beginning part of stages of change, whether you've heard of it before, whether you haven't, this is a, a just an initial overview. We're gonna describe each stage and the movement between them and attempt to differentiate between those different stages so you can tell where you or where someone else is on this continuum of change regarding a specific issue. And at the end, there's gonna be a couple of vignettes, just like a, a little quick uh, test. So here actually are the stages, uh, all, in, all in one place. We're gonna start with pre-contemplation, move through contemplation, preparation, action and in the maintenance and we're also going to be describing uh, relapse as we were talking we're, we were just talking about movement forward through and we'll also discuss movement back because as we know change is not a point a to point b type of phenomenon so let's start off with pre-contemplation and i love this quote it isn't that they can't see the solution they can't see the problem the real defining part of someone who is in pre-contemplation is that they don't feel that they have a problem. They feel that the other people around them have the problem. So if they don't have a problem, there's no intention of changing uh, anything about themselves. In fact, they don't even want to discuss it or hear about it. Because again, there's part of them that feels that they don't have a problem. And then there's another part of them hidden down deep underneath that may actually suspect that something is going on. Commonly, we refer to this as denial, and the person really wants to change the people around them. They want to keep doing what they're doing, and they want to change the people around them so that they can continue to do that. I've heard pre-contemplation referred to as pre-awareness of change, and then I've also heard of it as anti-contemplation, where the person's actually actively working to not hear that something is going on with that. So you may actually have some things going on about yourself, that some things that you may suspect or know about yourself may be a problem, but they're not in that position of, of full awareness yet. So what very often happens is people are in pre-contemplation for a long time, and then something either shifts internally or externally to move them into contemplation. Contemplation, people can stay here for years, and we refer to this as the butt stage, and butt is spelled correctly. And the reason they call it the butt stage is if you picture the contemplation stage as scales, a balance, and you have the argument to change on one side, the argument not to change on the other. So to illustrate that, you could hear someone say, I know I need to quit smoking, but I have a very stressful job. So the word but is that pivot point between where they're talking about change and then talking about staying the same. Uh, as you may see in future uh, presentations, one of the main reasons that people don't make the changes, they're afraid of failing. If you've had someone that's quit smoking and they've quit for a day or they've quit for a week, uh, at a certain point, they, if they relapse, then they shame themselves and feel bad. And you know, we, we sort of look at this all or nothing view of change instead of it being a process. So they don't wanna go through all that cycle. So to not do that, they don't even start. When people leave the contemplation stage, they tend to get kind of excited and fired up and energized. And that's something that we look for as helpers and we'll talk about that how to deal with that in the upcoming stages. And contemplation, I think, is captured by the saying, I have a problem, but I don't know what to do about it. So next up is preparation. Preparation is the stage that we helping types tend not to do so wonderfully well. Um, we have, most of us have been trained and most of our interventions are geared toward the action stage, which is coming up. Most people aren't in the action stage. So what do we do? We hang around and we wait for that person to give us just a little bit of daylight that they're ready to make the change. And then when they don't make the change, we assume that they don't want help. So I'll give you a classic example. Um, a, a client that I've worked with in the past has a serious addiction problem. Uh, he's an adult and he resides with his parents. His parents are constantly trying to get him into 
detox and rehab. And he says, no, 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 no. And then one day he'll say, okay, you know what? Tomorrow morning I'll go, I'll do it. And the parents make the calls, get the treatment approved, pack the car, they're all ready to go. You know where I'm headed already. The next morning he changes his mind. So they've gone through this loop a bunch of times. And they've gotten really frustrated. Now, part of this is the client's clear ambivalence toward change. But the other part of it is there's really no preparation happening. The preparation is the plan. Change with no plan is not going to stick. So another important piece about preparation is that some actions can be taken in the preparation stage, but that doesn't confuse them with action. Uh, I'll give you an unfortunate example from my own past. Joining a gym is a preparatory step. If you never go to the gym again, hypothetically, it was only that preparatory step. It's not an action step until the person's actually going to the gym. And yeah, I really did that. Um, so my suggestion would be that when someone is getting out of contemplation and they're finally giving you that daylight of, all right, I'm ready to do something, instead of let's do it, put that energy into the plan. Uh, the energy may fail in the planning process, which is better than putting yourself out and getting this whole thing going that isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, it's almost like pumping the brakes. Like, okay, now you're ready. Are you really ready? Because if you're not ready to make the plan, you're not ready to do it. So preparation is su summarized by, I'm making a plan to help with my problem. So now we move into action stage. This is where somebody actually makes it to the gym. Uh, great commitment of time and energy. The good news is that a visible change happens. The bad news is that even with any positive change in life, there are some negative stressors that come from it. Uh, example, friend of mine wanted to get in better shape, so he joined a gym, and he was planning on going to the gym three evenings a week to get himself in better shape. That's a good thing. He hadn't consulted his wife about where the money was coming from, and she's minding three kids three evenings a week, which she was also not consulted about. So you can see where there might be some stressors. She is supportive, but at the same time, uh, this change plan suffered from a lack of planning. Because, of course, these changes are a marathon, not a sprint. So the challenge is, how do we make the change stick? Uh, I don't care where you've worked. You have seen many new initiatives come and go. And if they have come and gone, very often there's something wrong with the initiative, but usually there's something wrong with the implementation plan. So the action stage is captured by, I am working on it, and it is difficult. So we move into maintenance. Now, the book tells you that um, maintenance is from six months on. I personally, I'm not a big fan of that. I think it's subjective. It's when the change gets easier. Just to stay with our metaphor of the gym, if it's really hard to get to the gym for the first three weeks and after three weeks you've got good momentum and it's easier to do, you're moving into maintenance. Uh, it depends on the severity of the habit and there's a lot of other factors involved. Most changes never make it to maintenance because the ones that haven't been planned out don't make it here. And it's sort of captured by I'm working on it and it's getting easier. Now, so far, we've only talked about movement forward through the stages of change. And as we know, that's not usually how it works. Relapse, or what they call recycling, is any movement backwards. And usually, it involves moving back to contemplation. Either that person's making a plan, and they throw out the plan, or they put it into action, and it doesn't work. Think about the idea of a diet that somebody stays with for a couple weeks and then goes back. The first thing about relapsing and recycling is that build it in that it's an expectation any big change in life is probably not gonna occur on the first go. We have to learn how to do it. Smokers tend to quit three to six times before they learn how to quit for a long term because they, keep, they have to find the things that are gonna trip them up. Is it hanging out with their friends? Is it going out somewhere? Is it you know, having that first cigarette in the morning or that cigarette after a good meal? What are the stressors that bring that back around again? Again, when somebody's in relapse, there are a couple major tasks. We'll talk about this more in the next video. We want to get past the point where they shame themselves and kick themselves and get back into what was wrong with the change plan. Let's not throw the change plan out. Let's not go back to contemplation. Let's, mark, let's keep going forward. So relapse is summarized by the term I messed up and dot, dot, dot. So a couple other details about the stages of change. These things are constantly changing. On Tuesday, you can make the change plan and it's all ready to go. And on Wednesday, it's not happening. The challenge that we make is that we get out in front of the clients. 
we are more ready for them to change than they are ready to change. And where we think they are doesn't matter. It's where they really are. If we are out in front of them, if we think they're ready for action and they're really not, they're still in contemplation or preparation, that will cause resistance. Resistance is caused by that discrepancy between where we think they are and where they really are. Another really critical, important piece of stages of change is that people are in different stages for different things. So let's take this hypothetical example at the bottom here. We have a person who's in pre-contemplation about smoking pot, preparation about cocaine use, and in contemplation about cigarette smoking. Which of those, or which more than one of those, should we be taking on and why? So let's take a look at this. We've got pre-contemplation, preparation and contemplation. We've got pot, we've got cocaine and cigarette smoking. Now, if you said preparation about cocaine use, that's the correct answer according to stages of change. However, if you said it because cocaine is the, more, the most dangerous of those three, then you did the right thing for the wrong reason. The reason for choosing preparation is they're the furthest along. We're meeting them where they are. Uh, if we spend, we could spend all sorts of energy trying to get them to stop smoking pot. They don't see it as a problem and we're going to waste a lot of energy there. Let's, if they're in preparation for cocaine, let's build the plan. And as you probably already surmised, if we do this progress on cocaine, we are making progress on these other things too. So just to wrap up, let's do a couple of vignettes so we can get familiar with applying these stages of change to some actual case studies. So let's start with this one. Larry's very angry, he's in the hospital, blames his family for sending him here, which has happened a number of times before. He doesn't wanna to go to groups and will only take meds if he has to. He does not wanna talk about his history of legal problems and psychiatric hospitalizations. What stage is Larry in? So the question to ask Larry is, if you ask Larry, does he have a problem with mental illness? His answer based on all this is no. And that means Larry is a pretty clear cut, uh, pre, he's in pre-contemplation. Let's work on the next one. Cecilia has been in the hospital. In the last month, she's begun coming to groups and sharing about her illness. She called her husband, told him to have all the alcohol out of the house by the time she's discharged, and she will be doing 90 meetings in 90 days after release. She got a notebook and is doing 12-step work in it. All right, Cecilia is not as easy as Larry, but let's, let's do that same template. If you ask Cecilia, does she have a problem with alcohol? And it sounds like the answer would be yes. So she's not in pre-contemplation. So next, does she have a plan? All right, I'm hearing pieces of a plan here between having the alcohol out of the house, 90 and 90, and doing 12-step work. So she's not in contemplation. So now let's look at preparation. Has she put this plan into action? And it looks like she's almost there. So if you had to push me on this one, I would say that Cecilia is in preparation. She's in very close to the action stage. So I think Cecilia illustrates that you don't necessarily uh, fit really clean cut into one stage of change. But I would say preparation, just about to go into action. Next one, Bruce has been a patient at the hospital several times. Now he's asking questions about bipolar disorder, which he's never done before. He's always denied having a mental illness, but now I ask things like, does bipolar go away? Well, I always have to take the meds and express as being tired of coming in and out of the hospital and moving all the time. All right, so if we ask Bruce, does he have a problem? Well, it sounds like his answer is changing. It sounds like in the past it would have been no, specifically regarding mental illness, but now it sounds like he's getting into a tentative yes. So Bruce is transitioning into contemplation because we don't hear a plan. There's no plan being put into action. Um, but it sounds like he is new into pre uh, new into contemplation about this, having recently been in pre-contemplation. All right, now Ed is in the hospital, states that he has schizophrenia and needs treatment for this here and on the outside. He states that smoking PCP got him in here and he never wants to do that again. He's interested in stopping smoking cigarettes, but tells you he enjoys pot and will begin using that daily after he's released. Okay, Ed is complicated. Ed is probably much more like the clients you're working with who have multiple issues going on and is in different stages for those different things. Uh, so here's how, and Ed also illustrates the fact that uh, people are not in a stage. So Ed is not a pre-contemplator or a contemplator. Ed is in various stages for various things. So let's break this out. I see four things listed here. I see that we have schizophrenia going on, we have PCP going on, we have cigarettes, 
and then we have pot. So we're going to divide Ed's situation into the four different areas here. So he states that he has schizophrenia and needs treatment for this here and on the outside. So does Ed acknowledge having a problem with schizophrenia? Sounds like it. Uh, where are we regarding a plan? Well, it sounds like he's open to a plan. So maybe it's time. I, I, at this point, I would put Ed right in between uh, contemplation and preparation. And how we would do that is let's see how he responds to the plan and see if there's any pushback. And then we'll see where, whether he's ultimately in preparation or contemplation. But I would say preparation. Let's give it a shot. Smoking PCP got him in here, and he never wants to do that again. Well, that's not a change plan, but that is some level of motivation. He does acknowledge having a problem, but there is no plan. So that makes him in con uh, contemplation. Interested in stopping smoking cigarettes. Well, that's the same thing. There's no plan, but he does seem to acknowledge it's a problem. So contemplation there. He enjoys pot and will begin using that daily after he's released. Okay, it doesn't sound like Ed acknowledges that that's a problem. So pot is in pre-contemplation. So we have a preparation, two contemplations, and a pre-contemplation. So the challenge is, so let's hook up Ed with treatment for his schizophrenia and see if he's interested in any sort of addictions treatment going along with that, if he wants that buddied up with that. And that would probably be a stage appropriate uh, intervention for Ed. So just to summarize this, uh, the change goes through a series of stages. It's not a, a neat and clean and easy process. Uh, these stages have some blur to them. You can be in between them uh, for the same issue and people move backward and forward through them. And again, we have pre-contemplation, which is, I don't have a problem. Contemplation, I don't know what to do about my problem. Preparation, I'm developing a plan to deal with my problem. Action, I'm working on my problem and it is difficult. Maintenance, I've been working on my problem and it's getting easier. And relapse is I messed up and next open-ended thing. Each stage has its own unique characteristics. And the, the reason for assessing what stage someone is in is so that you can design an intervention that is appropriate to that change, stage of change, so that you can move them forward. Um, we'll be talking more about these interventions in the second video in this series and also in additional uh, presentations about motivational uh, interviewing. So here's the information where this came from. This original slide deck was created by Bill Miller, one of the inventors of motivational interviewing. Uh, the Prochaska book, Changing for Good, is a really nice self-help book to help you determine where you are in your own stage of change and what the barriers are to moving forward. So again, catch the other video in uh, this series. And if you have any other uh, information about that, you've got my contact info on the front slide. Don't hesitate to reach out with any other questions, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.